Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 67, June 27th to July 3rd, 1862. Last week, we had the Battle of Oak Grove, which is so small that it's often overlooked as a precursor to the Seven Days. I think that is a tad unfair, and defying popular opinion, I will add it into the Seven Days. We also had Beaver Dam Creek to kick off the Seven Days proper. This week, we will continue with three more engagements as we start to see McClellan's promising bid to capture the rebel capital begin to crumble. We start first with an action known as Gaines's Mill. Just as a quick side note before we really get into the narrative here, we do have Patreon content that should go very nicely with our narrative today on the battle. And I know posting that a little bit earlier than we're actually going through the battle here, but still I think it is interesting if you want to see the uh, modern battlefield. And it is very much a case where there's a lot of land that is coming into the American Battlefield Trust, and that's always good, especially if you're interested in the Civil War and history in general. So I do have pictures posted that illustrate that, and if you're interested, please do check that out. So last week when we closed out, we mentioned how McClellan wanted to move Porter to a more defensible position. He would find it on a plateau containing several houses, including the Watt House. Below the plateau was a swampy area known as Boson's Creek. Porter's Fifth Corps would deploy here and make hastily constructed earthworks for defense. These were not the well-prepared positions they had at Beaver Dam Creek, but they would still serve their purpose. Porter's 1st Division under George Morrell and his 2nd under George Sykes would be in this area. Sykes has mostly regulars under his command, as well as a small brigade containing two New York regiments we actually met at Big Bethel, the 5th and the 10th New York. Artillery was provided by Stephen Weed, who will die on Little Round Top in 1863, and sharpshooters under Hiram Burdan would be used as skirmishers. It was a strong position, but one that was not intended to be permanent. McClellan was seeking to have a change of base and move away from White House Landing. Now, change of base is a more diplomatic way of suggesting a retreat in this scenario. McClellan would contend that he was outnumbered well after the battle, thinking he is seeing a 2 to 1 disadvantage. John Magruder was having an effect on his mindset, marching his troops to and fro again, making sure they were observed by Thaddeus Lowe in his balloon. One report came from George Zook, who personally scouted the rebels in this sector, and realized that slaves were employed for this purpose as well, adding to the supposed numbers. McClellan, of course, did not believe these reports. These men, he concluded, were massing for an attack, so minimal reinforcements would be available to Porter. Only the 1st Division of the 6th Corps under Henry Slocum. Jackson's men were still out there somewhere as well. It is around this time that Little Mac does have an idea to move on Petersburg, which again is the right idea and something Grant does in 1864. On the other side, Lee was ready to take another shot at a masterstroke. Jackson would be employed again to flank Porter on the Union right, supported by D.H. Hill. A.P. Hill would again pressure the front. Union defensive lines were not where he supposed they would be, however, Instead of the Boson's Creek line, he expected them to be further away to the east on the Powhite Creek line, which is more in the vicinity of Gaines's Mill. 
Gaines's was the largest plantation in the area, and thus the battle took this name. Lee personally conferred with Jackson, so it is likely that he understood what the objective was and probably how important he was to the whole operation. There was one problem, though. Despite having a local guide, Jackson took the wrong road again. You see, there are two places known as Cold Harbor. Cold Harbor is going to be a battle in 1864, Right now is actually sharing the same battlefield here in 1862, but there are two places known as Cold Harbor. The first is Old Cold Harbor, and the second is New Cold Harbor. Jackson wanted to go to Old Cold Harbor, but when you say to your guide, take me to Cold Harbor, then you run a 50% chance of not going to the right one. I think this sort of makes sense, because if you're a local guide and you get told, take me to Cold Harbor, well, obviously, you're going to want to go to the new one, not the old one. So I get where the mistake is coming from here. I've also seen an explanation that Jackson was on an alternative route that would take him in the wrong direction to Old Cold Harbor, by the way of Gaines's Mill. But obviously, Jackson wanted to come in on the flank and not go directly there. Jackson would have to backtrack his troops in order to get into the right position. Weirdly, if he just kept going on that road, he would have arrived sooner and perhaps been able to take advantage of Porter's lack of reinforcement earlier. Deciding to get into what he thought was a turning position would take time, but D.H. Hill was already at Old Cold Harbor and would take the place of the Valley Army in the coming assault on the Union right. Porter had set up his two divisions with Morrell on the left and Sykes on the right. They would be making a kind of inverted U-like formation. Three lines of Federals were on the high ground of the plateau, supported by artillery. Morrell had a brigade under Charles Griffin, who was stationed in the relative center of the line. These men would be near a farmstead called the Watt House. Butterfield's brigade held the extreme left flank, with Martindale to his right. Sykes had two brigades of regulars connecting with Griffin and extending to protect the right flank, and the road to Old Cold Harbor at the McGee House. There was a mix of wooded terrain in the center, with some approaches being cultivated fields, which would mark the Confederate path of assault. A.P. Hill's division would again take the brunt of the initial assaults on the Union troops. They had passed over the same terrain Porter had previously occupied, which was a grisly reminder of the day before. They're fallen still in heaps before the Union works. Several companies of the 13th Pennsylvania, our old friends the Bucktails, did not get the order they were falling back and were captured by the oncoming Confederates. Maxie Griggs' brigade would take the lead, having been held in reserve at Beaver Dam Creek. These regiments would all have a tough time attacking the center of the Union lines, only Griggs' men being able to make a foothold on the plateau. South Carolina troops would be hotly contested by the 5th New York, Duryea's Bobs, as they attempted to move on the plateau. In fact, the 1st South Carolina would suffer 57% casualties the heaviest loss on the day. Steady fire from the Federals would turn back Archer, Anderson, and Branch, their men getting caught in the thick woods and the swampy terrain of Bosun's Creek. For the second day, A.P. Hill's regiments were unsupported in their advance in a strong enemy position, which was getting old for them by this time, I'm sure. The wooded area in the right center would hence be known as Griffin's Woods for the Union Brigade commander. Griffin has with him the 9th Massachusetts, or the Fighting 9th, made mostly of Boston Irish, and the 4th Michigan, which was a suave regiment showing less gaudy uniforms than the usual, or Americanized, suave uniforms. 
with heavy firing that oftentimes would make visibility poor in the heavily wooded terrain, they would repulse the initial Confederate assaults. Despite there being a galling fire on the men of AP Hill, throughout the day, the casualties would mount on the Union side. The 5th New York and the 9th Massachusetts would suffer heavy losses in their defense. Later in the afternoon, D.H. Hill would start to put pressure on the right flank of the Union line. He would be held off for attacking, though, sitting where he was, ready to close the trap, should the rebels drive Porter. Jackson, too, was on the field, with Yule, his lead division, showing up. Jackson was asked by his superior if his men could do it. Jackson would respond that they could do anything, and that they certainly could handle that. That being the storm of lead that lay before them. The ineffectual initial assaults led Lee to send in Yule immediately. Yule was a good soldier, and started to send in his brigades right away, starting with Taylor's brigade, commanded by Colonel Isaac Seymour, due to Taylor being on medical leave. Isaac Trimble and Arnold Elsey's brigades would follow. Seymour, leading the brigade of Louisiana regiments, would be killed, as well as Robert O. Wheat, the commander of the Louisiana Tigers. Wheat reportedly shared a final drink with a subordinate, having had a premonition of his death. Losing Wheat would be demoralizing for the Louisiana troops. They would bark at Trimble's Georgia regiment as they entered the woods, that they were mighty fine, but it was hell in there. Elsie would also be wounded in the fighting, engaging Buchanan's regular troops. Lawton's Georgia Brigade, massive by Confederate standards at 3,000, would also see its first action at this point. These men were armed with infield rifles, making them one of the best armed units in Jackson's small Shenandoah Valley Army. Longstreet's men would arrive on the left flank of the Union line, brigades under picket, feinting attacks on Butterfield, who would earn the Medal of Honor on this day. Pickett was supported by Cadmus Wilcox and his Alabama regiments, as well as Roger Pryor with his mixed regiments including the 2nd Florida and Coppins, Louisiana's Wavs. Pickett would be wounded in the shoulder at this part of the battle. Butterfield has the 44th New York, also an Americanized Wav unit, and 83rd Pennsylvania, who wore Wav uniforms with green epaulets. Both of these regiments would gain fame on Little Round Top in 1863. Porter had grown concerned with the amount of enemy troops showing up and requested reinforcements from McClellan. McClellan would send him the single division of Henry Slocum for support. Slocum's brigade of New Jersey regiments, the 1st through the 4th, would arrive and be met by a man speaking wildly in French and gesturing toward the battlefield. This was actually the Comte de Paris, who was an observer of the campaign, and in his excitement, he had dropped English for his native French. Once confirmed who he was, brigade commander George Taylor would reportedly remark, we'll give him the 4th and see where he puts it. There was another interesting quote about the 1st through the 4th New Jersey, about how they were expert foragers. So the quote goes that if there was a chicken coop with eggs behind the Confederate line, then the New Jersey boys would definitely break through because they would need to get to the chickens. So gives you an idea of their reputation as well. Slocum's division also had Joseph Bartlett, with his mixed brigade, including the 27th New York, the Union Regiment, and the 3rd Brigade with the 95th Pennsylvania, also known as Goslin Zouaves. These regiments, though, would not be enough for Porter. Fitzjohn had been using Slocum's and McCall's regiments piecemeal, inserting where needed. This added to the confusion amongst the Union regiments, because they were breaking up brigade cohesion. Additional units would be dispatched, but would they be in time? Last to arrive on the field was the division of Chase Whiting 
bringing up the rear of Jackson's column. Jackson's brigades had been inserted pell-mell onto the field, some of Whiting's men actually behind Longstreet. This is where Samuel Fulkerson would be wounded by a stray shot. Whiting would have brigades under John Bell Hood and Evander Law. Hood, of course, we have mentioned commanded the Texas Brigade, which contained all Texans but one Georgia regiment. These Georgians were considered honorary Texans. Law had under his command the 4th Alabama, 2nd and 11th Mississippi, and the 6th North Carolina. Lee would ask Hood if he could take the federal position, to which Hood replied that he would try. It was 7 p.m., and Lee was running out of time. With D.H. Hill's division, Jackson's men, as well as Longstreet, he would assemble one last effort to dislodge Porter. Now, when you think of massive Confederate attacks, you usually think of Pickett's charge, and rightfully so, it's probably one of the more famous charges of the war. At approximately 30 or 32,000 men, Lee would launch his largest attack of the war at Gaines's Mill on June 27, 1862, at approximately 7 p.m. Hood would be instrumental in leading his Texas regiments at this time, hopping off his horse and moving on foot. He would actually peel the 4th Texas out around Law's regiments and throw it straight into the Union line around the Watt House. This was followed by the 18th Georgia. Hood and Law would break the three lines of the Federals gaining the plateau. This was combined with an attack by Longstreet's men, including Cadmus Wilcox and his Alabama Brigade. D.H. Hill would argue it was his men who had actually broken through first around the McGee House. Hood would actually admit to Wilcox it was possible his men held the honor, but the Texans were able to hold the line. So massive and quick was the Confederate attack that the first line could not fire fast enough at the oncoming rebels. As the first line retreated, they would block the fire from the second and thus push back the third, a massive confusion that made for easy targets. It was not long before the Confederate assault all around would be successful. The Union defense crumbled. Now two brigades of the Second Corps under Thomas Francis Marr and William French would arrive on the field too late to stop the rout. But they would be just in time to deter the Confederates from continuing the pursuit to the Chickahominy. A large number of Union soldiers surrendered, including a majority of the 4th New Jersey, giving that brigade the most casualties of the battle. In an odd moment of the war, Philip St. George Cook would attempt a cavalry charge to stop the Confederate advance, but was stopped by a volley from the 18th Georgia and 11th Mississippi. Twenty-two guns were captured from Porter as the Union Army retreated to friendly lines. Lee was in no position to pursue with the darkness setting in and the amount of casualties he took. 8,700 were lost, compared to 6,800 for the Union. Lee had his victory, but the price was high. Whiting's division will lose over 1,000 of a roughly 5,000-man division. After the battle, John Bell Hood reportedly sat on a cracker box and wept. Gaines's Mill, the largest battle of the Seven Days and the Peninsula Campaign, was over. Coinciding with the action going on at Gaines's Mill, there was a reconnaissance in force being conducted by Robert Toombs of Magruder's command. Toombs had a brigade of Georgia regiments at this point. Remember, Toombs used to occupy a space on the cabinet of Jefferson Davis. This would be conducted at a site of the Golding and Garnett Farms south of the Chickahominy. It may have added to paranoia on the behalf of McClellan, who was withholding reinforcements for Fitz John Porter due to the threat of a Confederate counterattack. To his credit, he did instruct William Franklin to take his remaining division and try to probe the Confederate flank. Franklin had already burned the bridge to his front, and so the action was abandoned. Tombs of David R. Jones' division would be sent to strictly probe and gain information on the Union Sixth Corps, but it developed from artillery duel to a sharp fight. This would be between Magruder's division and the brigades in Baldy Smith's division 
especially that of Winfield Scott Hancock. There was very little to show from this fight, Tombs advancing again on the second day and sustaining casualties. 438 Confederates fell, as opposed to 189 Federal troops. Meanwhile, McClellan would continue his move south toward the James River. Of all the options he possessed, this seemed like the best one. His army would be protected under the guns of the Navy, and could continue to operate along the James River. Once there, he could move his army to a better position for evacuation, such as Harrison's Landing. But this would take time. Remember, the Union Army is large, and there are heavy siege guns that have been brought up. There were also now wounded men who needed to take the lead. McClellan would leave a rear guard of troops at a place called Savage Station, which sat along the York Railroad near the Williamsburg Road. William Brooks and the Vermont Brigade of Smith's Division, as well as Sumner's 2nd Corps, would be placed there, but there was no real commander named on the field. Heinzelman's Corps was also present, but he would move his men away to a different area. We can place blame strictly on McClellan's shoulders for not naming an officer in charge before moving on to continue his efforts in getting his men to safety. Here, Lee saw an opportunity. He could use Magruder's and Huger's men to move forward, as well as call up additional reinforcements under Theophilus Holmes and his Department of North Carolina stationed at Petersburg. Longstreet and the Hills would move to suitable crossing of the Chickahominy, while Jackson would repair bridges and continue the pursuit. It was a pretty good plan, but Jackson would continue to underwhelm. Reverend Dabney was given the task of building the bridges, but was obviously out of his depth. Jackson may have been under the impression he was to remain where he was and watch for a Union counterattack. This sentiment is actually expressed by orders he received from Lee. Still, there is a continual lack of coordination and communication from Lee, Magruder, Huger, and Jackson on the 28th and 29th. It would be on June 29th that Magruder would make contact with the Union rearguard. Lee's plan had completely unraveled as Jackson remained where he was and Huger did not advance in support. Instead, it would be Magruder alone against an unknown number of the enemy, who was busy with earthworks and destroyed excess stores. Magruder would send in Lafayette McClaws and his division to make contact with the enemy. McClaws was a Georgia native and West Point graduate. After the war, he will go back to Georgia and serve as the postmaster of Savannah, among other jobs. In 1862, McClaws had with him Joseph Kershaw and Paul Sims. Kershaw was a lawyer from South Carolina who had served in the Mexican-American War as a volunteer. He will be in the Eastern Theater for almost the entirety of the war and be listed under the category of capable, non-professional officers. Paul Sims was a banker and planner from Georgia who will command troops all the way up until Gettysburg where he will be mortally wounded. The Vermont Brigade had set up in advance of the other Union Allied forces, and so while Sims and his brigade engaged them, Kershaw would lead his South Carolina troops around their left, flanking them entirely, and move on to men under the command of William Burns in Sumner's Corps. Now Burns has under his command the famous Philadelphia Brigade. Some of these men we have seen before, being part of Baker's California regiments at Ball's Bluff. They would, at first, buckle under the weight of the South Carolinian charge, but be reinforced with the 1st Minnesota and the Irish Brigade of Marr to hold the line. Union troops, including the Vermont Brigade, would run out of ammunition during the fight. William Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade would support Sims during the fighting. Barksdale had taken over for Richard Griffin, who was killed by a shell fragment during skirmishing earlier in the day. Griffin was Pennsylvania-born, but had moved to Mississippi and was a friend of Jefferson Davis, 
Darkness would fall with neither side gaining the advantage, federal losses being a little over a thousand, compared to a little less than 500 rebels. Bull Sumner was almost relieved of command when he initially refused to continue the retreat to the James. It had been McClellan's plan to deny him command on the field after his disappointing performances of the previous battles. But in this scenario, Sumner was probably correct. He stated that if he was given the proper support, he could not only stop the retreat, but he could also most likely push back the rebels. At the very least, he probably could have made things difficult for Lee, but we'll never know. Federal forces would withdraw further that night, leaving dead, wounded, and supplies behind. Eventually, the Federals would set up with Israel Richardson's division and Baldy Smith on high ground beyond White Oak Swamp facing north. The rest of the Federal Army would form a line to meet the approach of the Confederates from the west. Central to their defense was a place called Glendale and a farm called Fraser's Farm, the area name for the prominent family who lived there, although it was actually owned by the Nelsons. At the end of the line was Malvern Hill, a place where Porter's spent 5th Corps set up after their tough fight at Gaines's Mill, although they had not created a heavy defensive position as of yet. Lee would see his opportunity yet again to destroy McClellan. Little Mac is off again trying to find a new base, leaving the army leaderless for June 30th. Lee could send Jackson across White Oak Swamp to the north, have Benjamin Huger push combined with Longstreet and Hill on the rest of the Union line, and then have Theophilus Holmes capture Malvern Hill. A pincer move that could, if done correctly, cut off the Union army. A common theme, though, of our talks here is that there would be problems. For one, Jackson is not going to cross White Oak Swamp. He has artillery open up and messes around with the bridge building, but other than that, he stays put. Now, besides the fatigue theory, it is also thought that Jackson perhaps was saving his men. Famously, he would bypass Hampton Wade without a word when the South Carolinian told him a bridge was complete and disregard his cavalry commander when told of a ford where they could probably flank the Union rearguard. Could Jackson have carried the field at White Oak? Probably not, but because he did very little, 11,000 men were freed up to move to the federal center. Huger, likewise, would not move in the direction it supposed Phil Kearney's men were. Instead, he would focus on building a new road instead of clearing one that was obstructed by trees. Huger was cautious and did not want to be blamed as he had at Seven Pines. Holmes would not take advantage of Mulvern Hill, instead staying on a position called the New Market Heights. His men received fire from gunboats on the James, and would decline an attack against Porter. Magruder was routed away from the rest of the army to help, but arrive in time to do nothing. So this leaves the Union Center. Now the Pennsylvania Reserves under McCall were exhausted and in the center of the line. They had left a gap between them and Hooker's division. If A.P. Hill could exploit this gap, he could break the Union forces, and they would most likely be routed. He sent in his brigades under Kemper, Branch, and Archer. Unfortunately for the Confederates, these attacks would lose cohesion, ending up with each brigade essentially attacking one at a time. The result was that the Union line would bend but not break. It did, however, force McCall to shift his forces from right to left, weakening that side of his position. Three batteries were the objective of the Confederate attacks. By nightfall, they would all be in rebel hands after fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Edward Porter Alexander would mention that this was the toughest hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting he witnessed during the war. Longstreet would continue with assaults from Jenkins and Wilcox. These units would fare better due to their shift in manpower, although at great cost. 
the reserves would retreat at the pressure, their third intense fighting during the seven days. Jenkins would call on his men to eliminate the horses of the battery and thus be able to capture the cannon. Union forces, under Phil Kearney, would hold out, as would Hooker, and timely reinforcements would arrive in order to avoid disaster. Federal regiments were able to move where needed in order to avoid a breakthrough, arriving here and there, from the Ford and from the broken commands of the Corps commanders. Confederate reinforcements would also be thrown in to bolster Longstreet's flanks. Of the 12 brigades available, 11 of them were deployed during the fighting for the Confederate side, illustrating how badly they could have used Huger or Magruder. Several units got into action, including the 20th Massachusetts, who we have not mentioned since Ball's Bluff. Francis Barlow and the 61st New York play a key part in holding the line as well. The 47th Virginia would, on the day, capture a battery and would actually capture George McCall, who wandered into the lines of the Confederates. As darkness fell, though, the Federals had done just enough to stave off disaster. Casualties were relatively even, with Confederates losing 3,600 and the Union Army losing 3,700. Although the casualties were lighter than Gaines's mill, Glendale was probably the closest that Lee came to destroying McClellan during the Seven Days. We can hold off for now, after a big episode. This sets us up nicely for the final installment of the Seven Days Battles next week. We had Gaines's Mill, Savage Station, and Glendale, also referred to as Fraser Farm. Find out next time if Lee is finally going to crush McClellan, or if the Army of the Potomac is going to make good on their escape. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.